Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. Uh, don't really have a fun cold open for this one, RJ, because not the most fun vibe around the Kraken these days is there as they're on an eight game losing streak yeah the the vibes are non-existent it seems like around the Kraken as I've just gotten back from their practice and yeah that's kind of where we're at yeah so uh we'll get into that in just a second but of course want to thank Queen Anne Beer Hall for sponsoring this podcast like they have all season long and remind everybody both of their locations great place to go watch the March Madness we are headed into the Sweet 16 here RJ I mean, this is when I really kind of start paying attention to it. You know, the field gets down, it start, stuff starts going well. All the, all the, uh, all those, you know, weird teams that are somehow there, they're all gone now. We've just got all the, all the teams that spend way too much money on this stuff. Yep, definitely. Hey, I mean, I like learning about the existence of some of those smaller schools. That's you know, true. I, di- I didn't know they were there. That is true. But the point is, you can go to Queen Anne Beer Hall, catch all the great March Madness games that are going on uh, as the month continues. And then also want to remind everybody that over on Patreon later tonight, uh, so if you're watching this basically as it comes out, you've still got time, uh, you can head over to patreon.com slash Emerald City Hockey, and I will be having my prospect chat uh, this evening. Going to be looking at some more Kraken prospect player tape, talking and kind of taking a look at the whole Kraken uh, system as as the major junior seasons and the European seasons have kind of wrapped up for guys. Take stock of where the Kraken prospect uh, pool is at because given the way the Kraken have shifted here, RJ, I think next month might be more looking at draft eligible guys rather than uh, Kraken prospects. <laughs> yeah, sure seems like it. But you know what? This is a really well-timed prospect, chat. I think everybody could yeah. use this with the present as bleak as it is. I, I think the future is still bright. Yep, definitely, definitely. And then now on to the podcast, RJ. So we're going to be talking about what we want to see from the Kraken kind of next season um, in a little bit. And then we'll do a lot of talk about the Firebirds as well. We'll kind of save that for last so we can end on a on a positive uh, there talking about the Firebirds. But of course, we got to start with the news and notes. And that includes practice today. And, and in the aftermath of last night losing game seven, uh, game eight for them, RJ, eight game losing streak. And th- I mean, we, we had Haxtell come out pretty, you know, decisive in what he wanted to say. And he, he kind of talked about some stuff, pretty fiery for him, maybe not fiery for other people, but fiery for Haxtell. What was the aftermath of all that today at practice like? Right. So this was a, a much anticipated practice. I mean, certainly after the way last night's game went, look, the Kraken have lost eight in a row, seven in a row at home. I, they were just embarrassed on home ice in their last game again. And by Hackstall standards, you said you called it direct. I think he was very direct. Uh, he didn't hold back about how the teams play. He said it's beyond disappointing. Um, he said the group has a choice to make now. And, and what the choice is, is obvious. Are they going to play the right way and play for each other? or not. Uh, And we still haven't had a game after that to find out, but we did have practice today. And so I was really curious what the tone of practice was going to be and what the takeaways were going to be from it. Uh, And I mean, practice, it it was more competitive. It was definitely more physical than usual. There were a lot of uh, condensed smaller area drills, like where they'd kind of just go blue line in and they'd set up the nets on either side. You'd kind of run a three on three type of thing. And there were a lot of battles in tight guys had were close to each other. And so you had that competitive nature. Um, so it looked a little bit different than the average practice, kind of more more condensed everything, really. Um, but I, I don't know, something about it. You, you saw frustration from some guys. Uh, you know, you, you saw a couple guys you know, smash their sticks in frustration and, you know, a little bit of complaining, that sort of thing, which you'd hope to see after an eight game losing streak. But it just felt kind of odd to me that this was all happening now. <laughs> I don't know that we didn't see this at all before that everybody was in a good mood and laughing and joking around. And all of a sudden now, I don't know, it just part of it. It just felt kind of for show to me. I, I don't know. I, I can't explain exactly why I, I think that way, but part of it, it just looked like it was just supposed to be there, you know? Yeah. And I, I obviously I wasn't there, so I can't speak directly to it, but I'm with you in the sense of like, why, why now? 
like what you you mm-hmm. weren't you were okay with losing seven in a row but eight is where you draw the line like like that doesn't make sense uh for anybody much less a professional athlete so um i i could see that i mean look it's not like i don't know everybody was was really paying attention to this practice so maybe there was yes the feeling that you needed to to kind of do something uh say something do something um on on the player side of things right i mean ownership was there part of ownership was there Mm -hmm. watching this practice right so i i could see them maybe taking that tact i don't think it was performative from hackstall I think Hackstall did probably really want to work these guys and, and try to turn things around just based on how stern he was last night after the Montreal game. Because, to be fair, and this is what I started off the post game last night with, was you can't let this happen. You can't let this continue, right? If you're the organization, this has to stop at some point because you don't want it to become the normal culture for the group where everybody is just kind of check can just check out when the season's over um, when they check out. And even if they're losing games, you run in with, you know, run into situations where like I talked about in Arizona guys are laughing right after the loss. Like you can't, like you just blew that game and you're like smiling and laughing about it as you're walking back to the locker room. Like you can't do that. You can't let that become normalized within your culture. And so I was, I was pretty serious last night thinking before you joined and and told us how Hackstall was like, I really was wondering if we were going to see a coaching change today, just because something had to happen. You're starting another homestand with another embarrassing loss where you can't even get out of the first 20 minutes without being in a four, nothing hole, right? Like, there is just so much kind of permeating all throughout this that is that is just the stuff that you got to cut out. Um, I was wondering if we would see a big change. We're seeing a big change in attitude, at least from, you know, potentially management and certainly from Dave Haxtall. We'll see what that ends up doing for them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if the players were that okay with a loss three days ago. I don't know why you'd be so then upset now all of a sudden. That doesn't really make sense to me. Right. And, and also now I, I'm starting to have some questions even on the, the coaching and management side where if you listen to post game or if you were there for post game after this last one, it, it felt, I think for me and probably both of us reassuring, right, that Hackstall came out and took such a direct line with the team mm-hmm. and and the way he talked to the media. And it felt like that's kind of gotten walked back a little bit today. Uh, given, I know, I know, like, I've, I'm not happy to hear it either. And it doesn't take away from anything he said yesterday. But if you look at a couple assumptions that we made last night, and the first one being that we know how he spoke to the media, we know how he spoke to us, right? The first assumption is that he must have kind of given it to the team after the game, right? He must have delivered a similar message, like, guys, we have a choice to make in here. And you know what it better be. Uh, but today, I, I, he made a couple of very interesting comments, I thought. First of all, he mentioned that he didn't talk to the team after the game last night because he was asked if the message had kind of changed today as opposed to yesterday. And he said, well, you know, I, I didn't address the team after the game last night. So now we know that. Uh, and then the second thing, and I, I think the, the most major thing that we assumed last night is the call-ups of, of Logan Morrison and Ryan Winterton, the message that we assumed that that sent uh, because the news of that came out maybe an hour or so after the Hackstall media availability. And I I know you were were thrilled about that. You sent me a text, right? You said that's the perfect message. Yeah. Calling those guys up because of what that represents. It means the veterans, you're on notice now. Mm -hmm. You could lose some ice time. You could lose a roster spot. And we're calling these guys up to send a message to the group. And that's the biggest change, I think, in what Hackstall said today. He actually said that the um, – because, of course, he was asked about that. And he said calling those guys up was not a message to the rest of the group. He he shied away from that right off the bat. He said, no, it's it's not a message to the group. It's it's about you know what those guys have done, and they've earned a spot. But uh, Dylan, <laughs> I feel like it should be a message to the group. Yes. I feel like that's absolutely what it should be for. And and Hackstall said that's not what it's about. Again. And you, I thought that was very interesting. Right. Again, something has to change, right? Like this can't be considered acceptable for a bunch of reasons. One, like I mentioned already, you can't let it become the culture where it's okay to lose eight in a row to six of them at home. 
right? In in front of everybody, right when you were still competitive for a, a playoff spot, when all this started, right? Like you can't let that become the culture and everybody gets so checked out that they just don't look like they really care anymore, right? And and we're not the only people to be saying this. Everybody is saying that. So you can't you can't let that become the culture for one. Uh, internally within the organization, you can't let that become the culture and the message that you're sending to fans either. Right. And that's, that's the other big thing about this. And, and I, I, I promise I will loop this back around to, to what Hackstall said there. I'm, I'm working on this, um, which is, you know, sports only exists because it is entertainment for people, right? The whole business behind sports, why sports is as large as it is, why all of these people involved have the salaries that they have, why these players can make millions of dollars every year is because they are providing entertainment to fans. They are providing an escape to fans and fans use what little um, you know, extra time and disposable income they have to support these teams because it brings them joy. The, the fastest way to lose fans, the fastest way for people to say, I'm not going to use what little disposable income I have on you guys anymore, is to go out there in a game like this where somebody pays however much to enter the building, maybe these days not, not nearly as much as it used to cost to enter the building, or to subscribe to Root, right? To subscribe on cable or Fubo to Root, right? And pay that, that fee to be able to watch this team. And you go out there and you don't try for them. And you go out there and you continually get embarrassed. You go out there and you can't score goals. You go out there and you go down 4 nothing in the opening period at home, right? Like that is the one thing you just, you can't happen because if, if everybody does that, right, sports ceases to exist, right? The money doesn't, doesn't come in this, the whole, the whole system breaks, right? And so that's the other aspect of this that absolutely needed to change and you need to change it, right? Like we're already seeing that attendance is down. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. I, I want to talk about that, but like attendance is already down. Your TV viewership numbers weren't good to begin with. I can't believe that they're good now, right? Like this is a, this is something that the the team and the organization needs to take extremely seriously because all of their jobs and their livelihoods can ultimately be on the line if it if it was to continue that way beyond just the fact that it's not a good sustainable culture and so when you, you have Hackstall out there basically walking this stuff back making it about well we just wanted to reward these two other guys right when you're not directly sending that message you're not putting the team on blast publicly that this is unacceptable the way all of the fans are sitting there and saying this is unacceptable right i don't want to spend my money to watch these guys not try it it just it's it's the worst message possible you could be sending to the fans because the fans are all saying the other thing they want to hear you say the other thing you're in a position where you can say the other thing right you, very easily you can just say it it's not like coaches have never put players on blast before especially during big losing streaks and just to prove that that wasn't what it was for, he said the decision to call them up was actually made before last night's game. Right. Which which it sounds like it could have been just based on Logan Morrison's comments, right? About Yeah, no, about, it's, I believe yeah, it. It, it yeah. is consistent, yes. Yeah, I believe that's consistent. But, like, why say that? Why give us that information? This is a pretty secretive organization, <laughs> okay, everybody? Like, on the media side of things, they really like to keep things close to close to their chest. Why disclose that bit of information? That was the one secret you could have kept so that at least publicly you have your fan base thinking like, wow, okay, the organization's taking this seriously and I want to go and support these young guys coming in because I want to support that message being given to the team because that's what I feel. And I feel very comfortable saying that that's what fans feel because we're on post game every night with everybody saying that's how they feel. We're reading it in the Discord. We're seeing it on Twitter. We're seeing it on Instagram. That's how everybody feels about this team right now right like i don't understand why you would do that at the expense of players which look it's their job to sometimes be told they're not doing it well that's why we have coaches right to tell them what to do like that's how the system works uh i i'm just i'm so befuddled by this it, it's so against normally how the crack could operate and it just seems so tone deaf to the way the vast majority of the fan base is feeling right now. I'm just really, really surprised that they went ahead and did that. Right. I mean, th there's two sides to this. What are you willing to say? And Hackstall, you know, put his team on blast, at least last night in the media. But also, what are you willing to do about it? And I think that's where things have been really walked back. And I think fans, you know, they, they see actions are louder than words, right? Yep. Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing here is they kind of walk back 
you know, this message, and I, I know that's just more words, but really, I guess that also gets kind of to the heart of why I felt like, you know, there, there was a sense of, of it being performative at practice today is because, yes, the guys were more physical. Yes, there was even some frustration there. But at no point do I still think this team and this roster, at least the veterans anyway, are uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I, I think you have to be a little uncomfortable after what's happened so far. And I, I don't think the call-ups have achieved that at all. No, I mean, look, being a professional athlete is a difficult job, right? I, I give them that. I know there's some people who don't think it's that way. I 1000% do, especially in a sport like hockey, where you're playing way too many games it, for a contact sport, right? I, I will give them that. It's an extremely difficult job. And a lot of times when it comes to being a professional athlete, uh, and, and professional sports, right? The difference between a win and a loss can just come down to effort because everybody is skilled, right? You don't get there if you're not skilled. You don't get there if you don't know how to put in the work, right? Nobody nobody just coasts to the NHL, right? I mean, maybe they do for a little while, but then they na- they end up like Nail Yakupov and they're gone after a couple of years, right? Like nobody lasts long in the league if you're not willing to put in the work. And so to, when and for a lot of guys, the main motivation for that is winning, right? They want to win the Stanley Cup that I think if you asked NHL players, almost all of them, 100 percent would say that is their primary motivation for being there is to try to win a Stanley Cup. So when that's taken off the board, I get that it could be hard to have the motivation to go into work every day and, and to put your body on the line and to put in that work and to put in that effort each and every game. But that's where the other side of it, the financial side of it should kick in, right? It's your job. You're getting paid. And again, the reason you're getting paid is because you are performing for fans and you've got to show up and you've got to give that effort for the fans because they are what's ultimately paying you, right? Yes, your your check is from the team, right? When you go, you know, direct deposit, it's coming from the team. It's not coming from all of us. But at the end of the day, it is coming from everybody else, right? That's how the team has the money. And so I, I think that's the other side of this that um, I, I don't know is totally felt or talked about. It's not something that's talked about a lot in sports, right? You you and I know this across all sports. This isn't like exclusive to the Kraken. It's not always talked about that way, right? People within sports, by the time you get up high in a front office or in league management or any of that kind of stuff, I think that sometimes gets forgotten about. But that's at the end of the day where this is all coming from. And it's I, I think it's one of those things where from time to time, I think people need that reminder that, again, yes, you're not your your primary motivation is off the table now. I get that. And that sucks. It sucks. It sucks. And you're hurt. And it's game, you know, 69, 70 of an 82 game season. And you're just trying to get through this. I totally get that. I'm not saying that this team needs to be above 500 the rest of the, rest of the way. They don't even need to win a single game the rest of the way. Right. I think fans would be on board with that. It means a better draft position. But the fans <laughs> need you to try and you need to try for yourself. Right. Like at some point. You need that athlete ego or something to kick in to get these guys to try and be reminded of that. And like I said, I just don't feel like that's existing anywhere around this situation right now. Yeah, I mean, that's the other element to it. The other thing players play for is just pride for one another. And Haxtell yeah. even kind of alluded to it after the last game, right? You play for yourself and you play for your teammates. Uh, and, and he said, we're not doing that right now. He, he admitted that's what's going on with the team. And, and I do wonder also... Again, you're, you're willing to say that, but what are you willing to do about it? Well, and and, th- and yeah, he was and he was willing to say that to you in the media. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he wasn't willing <laughs> to say that to them, right? If he's not yeah. telling them, I would have done that last night. I would have gone in there and I would have said, "Come back tomorrow and tell me why you're playing this game." All right? Like, give me yeah. a reason why you're you should keep playing this game right now. Like, I I why isn't he asking them that question? Right. And well, and that's another issue, too, is all season, even if he has brought that up to them, it's been all bark and no bite. I mean, the the reluctance to scratch any regulars. And I think this has been part of his M.O. just forever. But he's not one of those coaches that scratches regular guys for for overperformance. He doesn't do it. And I think this season, certainly where you've had guys that at, at certain times, you certainly could scratch those guys. 
and, and he just hasn't sent that message or, or if he does it's to like Bjorkstrand a couple games ago where I'm like that's the guy you're singling out <laughs> yep. um so I, that I that I don't understand too and I guess you know maybe there's the opportunity for it with with Morrison and Winterton coming in probably next game where then that also raises the question who gets scratched and I definitely want to talk to you about that one because I think mm-hmm. it's it's the opportunity to send a message to some guys I don't know if Haxtell's going to take advantage of that opportunity but um you know there, there are certainly some guys I I can think of that maybe deserve to be scratched well I mean let's go ahead and just get into that right now right and we're going to talk about uh uh you know Morrison and Winterton in a little bit um we're going to kind of let that feed into the to the uh Firebird stuff and and talk there um but like let's let's talk about that right like there's there's been a lot of guys on this th- on this team that I feel like are in that boat in that situation um like like you referenced uh and and I get him not always scratching somebody just because they're struggling right I get the idea that you want to keep guys in there and let them try to work through it particularly younger players like Maddie right Maddie starting yep. the season and struggling to score and try to get on the board and stuff right it doesn't it doesn't make sense to scratch the 21 year old who's struggling and still just trying to figure out how to be an NHL regular in what's going to only be his second full season but this is a team that has a lot of guys who have been around for a long long time uh, who were struggling at various points this season. I'm with you. Bjorkstrand made no sense the other night to kind of single out and be like, that's the guy that we need more from and, and to put him down. I know there's been guys that have been in and out of the lineup like a, a Yamamoto, right? So I don't know that I'd, I would necessarily go in that direction. Um, but like there's been times this year, maybe not right now recently, but there's been times this year that I thought like a Jordan Eberle should have mm-hmm. been on that list, right? Um, I think right now, I think you could probably say Brandon Tanev should probably be on that list, right? Yeah, it'd it'd be a bummer to lose him on the PK, but, like, he's not doing anything else for you right now, right? Like, as far as, as far as guys like that. And, and, and then defensively, I, I know you have the injuries and now you've got the other injury to Riker Evans, but, like, I would have called somebody up and replaced Justin Schultz a while ago. Yeah, I mean, certainly once you've hung on to him after the trade deadline, you're not showcasing him for a trade anymore. He's yeah. going to be gone next season. I, I don't mind sending that message at all. I know Hackstall is extra picky about the D pairs. He doesn't like to change anything with them if he if he can. I'll help it at all. But yeah, I mean, as far as the forwards, I think with two players coming in, you do have the opportunity to scratch a couple guys. And I mean, for me, Tanev is at the top of that list. I mean, you mentioned him already, but I just think... <laughs> Look, anybody who's watched the last few Kraken games has has seen the frustration growing with Tanev. I don't think the attitude's all that great either. I think he could certainly use that message maybe more than anybody else on this team. And then uh, Andre Burakovsky is another mention, uh, name that I would mention. I, you know, he's been up and down and he's kind of had his moments, but you know, I think the effort side has has been lacking at times, and I think he would benefit from that message. And certainly earlier in this season, there were times mm-hmm. where, where I thought he could have used it. And then the other one that's maybe a bit more tricky, and I don't think there's any way that Hackstall does it, is Yanni Gord. Yeah, I, I had him highlighted one, right? here. Yep. So honestly, for me, it's Tanev one, Gord two, and he, Gord hasn't been playing that well recently. I, no. He hasn't always been that pepper pot every game. He hasn't consistently been bringing the effort that we know that he can bring. And isn't isn't that what a scratch like this? is all about is kind of reinforcing that for a player. He also hasn't been producing either. I think he's got like one goal and a handful of assists in his last 20 games, Mm -hmm. 25 games. You know, he hasn't been producing. The reason I don't think Hackstall do it is just because you're really short at centers. If you don't, I mean, if you scratch him at that point, but again, at this point, it's not about, well, maybe for him, it is about wins and losses and saving a job, (laughs) but you know, really it's not about wins and losses. So I don't think he'll go in that direction, but Tanev and Gord is who I go with. Yanni Gord right now has the lowest po- point total in a full season that he has ever had uh, as an NHL player, right? Just to put this in perspective, uh, he has 26 points in 68 games this year. Uh, his next lowest is uh, a couple years ago in Tampa. He had 30 points in 70 games in that full season. Um, and then his eight goals would also be the lowest since the 10 that he had in that same season again, where he, he obviously, you know, th- that was like the end of the season when kind of uh, COVID kicked in and, or a little before COVID, um, but uh, didn't play the full season there. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on Yanni Gord. He has not been Yanni Gord this year, 
right? Like this is not the same player. He's he's on track to basically have half of his totals from last year production wise, and just the the spice. Has it always been there this year from him, right? We're not seeing him get after it. We've talked a lot about that line, and finally that line got broken up uh, with him, Bjorkstrand, and Tolvanen. Because um, really, you know, Tolvanen's chipped in here and there throughout the season. Bjorkstrand's put together a, a pretty good campaign. Uh, but Yanni Gord, it really felt like a lot of that stuff was was kind of gone. They weren't even really using him defensively either, right? Like, he, he had yeah, the opportunity and- with Wenberg on the roster most of the years to, to focus on offense, to try to really go with his guys, to try to establish something, become a, you know, an, an inside, you know, interior offensive player, be net front, all that kind of stuff. And he just never did. Yeah. I mean, we, we kind of know what he is at this point, I guess with, with Yanni specifically, you know, if I'm Haxel, I would give him one more game before scratch him. And the reason for that is I think he was working harder than just about anybody in practice today. Mm -hmm. And he was engaged and he was, he had that spice. He was himself. I mean, I think of this one drill, I think it was a a one-on-one type of drill where you go into the corner and you get the puck and you try and win the battle. And he was trying to cut across the net and he ended up knocking the net over basically almost onto Joey Decord. (laughs) And then Joey kind of pushes the net back up and, and Yanni still was battling. Like he knew the net was off, but he still was battling with the guy he was against and ended up backhanding the puck into the net that was, a few feet off at that point because he just would not give up on the play. So yeah. I, I hope we see some of that from him next game. So I wouldn't scratch him right away, Yeah, but you know, he'd be on the, on notice, I guess. I do like that. And you know what? He is one of those guys that I feel like if you do confront him, he will rise to that challenge kind of thing, right? Like you put the oh, team yeah. on blast, you put him on blast. He's going to come back strong from that. Right. And uh, so I I'm with you there. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting spot. Now let's circle back to to Hackstall, right? Like because we've we've talked about it and, and everything. I thought last night when they made the call up and that news came out, right? Already I was feeling like okay, Hackstall bought himself the rest of the season by saying what he said last night after the game. That was the impression I yeah. got was he knew his job was on the line at this point and he needed to do that. That was him. That was him basically doing the equivalent of say Ron Francis feeling like his seat is hot. So he fires the coach, right? Like that was, Mm -hmm. that's basically (laughs) it. When the coach throws the players kind of under the bus, that's the, that's the equivalent action. And it felt like he pressed that button. And then when we saw the news of the call up a little bit later on in the night, I went, okay, they're really then not looking at moving on from Hackstall at coach because they're probably all on the same page then, right? Coaching staff and front office, we can do, let's make these other moves and let's really put the pressure on the guys to respond here. And they're probably working in tandem. Um, I still think that that would be the case, even though the call-ups weren't what we thought they were. And even though Hackstall kind of walked back some of his comments last night, I'm, I'm at the point where I don't know that things could get bad enough now after, after everything from the last 12 hours, I don't know that things can get bad enough now that they would move on from him before the season's over. Yeah, I maintain my position. I mean, that's kind of what I've been saying, even as bad as this has all gotten, even up to last night, that uh, unless something crazy or unforeseen happens, he's got at least till the end of the season. It just makes the most sense for everybody from a, a incentive standpoint for Francis to keep him around and, and everything. And it certainly seems like the organization is in, in lockstep on this. Although, Dylan, I I did ask the question this morning to some people I was talking to, though, at practice, like, what happens if they get blown out tomorrow? If they go out tomorrow after all that message and and they lose 6-1 to the Ducks? Yeah. What happens? That then I think it ha- I I don't know maybe then it does have to happen it- I don't know in my mind that's impossible I just think like I don't no- see it happening either I I don't see it happening but if it if it does well, what happen- if it does then then yeah I guess you maybe you do see that move right because that's the thing you have I to. still you as have much to. as I feel like he is in a general sense totally safe to the end of the season I it would shock me if it wasn't but. I, I still think if if you can imagine one game going a certain way, which in the NHL anything's possible, yeah, you know, is he one game away from being gone? And I I, I can't say a definitive no. I can't either, right? Like again, something would have to happen. You have to send the message, right? Like this is that's basically how I started post game was with this after that game. 
you have to send a message. You got to send a message to the players that this is unacceptable and we were not going to let it continue. You got to send that to the coaching staff, what would be left of it. And you got to send that message to the fans that we're not okay with this. We are not going to be complacent and allow this to continue in front of you. Right. And, and yeah, I think if that happens, I mean, he can't survive that again. A nine game losing streak, all the six at home. Like if that I, was say, I don't even think they have to win. I, I, I think, you know, as long as you lose and have a, decent yes. showing if yes. it's you close can't get or blown whatever out. yeah i think and, i, I mean, think he could survive a, a blown lead late even yeah i think so yeah. yeah you just can't get blown out you can't go down four nothing in the first like you did last game it just has to look different than that yeah and the other thing about it too that i talked about and i'd love your opinion because you weren't really there for it is if they were to make a move with just a little bit of time left in the season i know people were speculating oh would they call up like people from coachella valley or whatever like dan bilesman to be the coach no you've got dave lowry there who you could use and could easily step in and and coach the rest of the way here you've also got jay leach who was interviewed for head coaching jobs and you could kind of see what you have in him if you wanted to maybe you know keep some uh, uh, you know, consistency continuity. and continuity. Yeah. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for um, there. You could bring him in and see what you, what you have for him. So I think that's the other aspect of all this is like, there are options available to them if things did for whatever reason, get so bad that they had to, to do that move. Yeah, definitely. You have a couple interim options in house that you just mentioned there. So yeah, I, I think it'd be very unlikely you'd see someone from Coachella Valley. I mean, I don't know for no, because it doesn't make sense because the Firebirds are having their own run. You don't want to pull anyone out of yeah. that. It doesn't benefit because if look, if the Firebirds weren't a playoff team, I'd be like, oh, you know, bring Jess Campbell up as an assistant for a few games and, and let yeah. her, you know, get some experience there. But no, taking her away from the Firebirds doesn't do anyone any good. No, it, it doesn't make sense to do that. And I and I think, you know, like I said, having having a guy like Dave Lowry around and on the bench and all that stuff during games, like it get he's a kind of like an extra coach anyway, right? Like so it gives mm-hmm. you that ability to not have to um pull people away from stuff. And, you know, I've talked about it. I'm even concerned about pulling players away from Coachella Valley <laughs> and it, it yeah. disrupting things a little bit too much there. Uh and I think that uh the guys they chose, they chose for a reason. And we'll like I said, we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, that's the that's the yeah. overall situation there, I think. Would it be too much of an aside to go on here, or too much of a tangent, or would it not fit in this part of the podcast to ask about maybe the assistant coaches for next year? No, I think no, let's talk there. about that. Yeah, let's go. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you look at the Kraken's assistants, I, I think th- regardless if Hackstall stays, well, I mean, if he goes, it's probably going to look all different too. But there's going to be some changes, right? I mean, Jay Leach, other teams have interviewed him for head coaching jobs. I wouldn't be surprised if he was poached somewhere for, mm-hmm. for some other job. And then Paul McFarland, Dylan. I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough that's that's inspired me. You know, he runs the power play over three years. I, I haven't seen enough on the power play. And I know personnel hasn't always been great, but yeah. I'd like to see another another voice in there, another plan in there. Yeah. And I like Dave Lowry. I mean, he's he's probably my my favorite of the three, but um, you know, he's he's on the older side. I wonder how much longer he might want to do this, or certainly if there's turnover. I mean, how different do we think the assistants could look next year? If if Hackstall's coming back, I mean, things, like I said, so much of this has to change, right? Like, you have to send yeah. a message to everybody involved that things cannot, that, that last season was, or this season, however you want to phrase it, was unacceptable. It is unacceptable, right? Like, everything about this is unacceptable. You have to send that message. So, yes, if Hackstall's going to stay, his coaching staff has to look different than around him. Um I'm with you. I, I would have moved on from Paul McFarland a while ago. I've, I've said this for a while just because, yeah. I mean, the power play is his is his domain and they've never done well. I mean, this might be the highest they've ever been in the power play. They're 19th in the league. <laughs> you know, they're still yeah, in like I know top half. Earlier in the year, yeah, they, they got up into around the top 10 and we were thinking, oh, this is, you know, actually decent numbers. But no, they're back into the bottom third of the league like they have always been. Yeah, so, you know, you have that, but also... I mean, Paul McFarlane's the guy who draws up plays, RJ, when they need something. And I don't know that I've ever seen anything drawn up that, like, afterwards they've come out there in the, you know, do or die situation offensively and been like, wow, that really worked. Or like, wow, that was at yeah. least interesting. Like, oh, they weren't quite able to pull it off, but I see what he was going for there. It's always and, like, and the and most I always basic watch for that stuff. too. And yeah. 
Yeah, no. Go I, I, I want to give him credit on one of these, right? <laughs> where, I, yeah. where it works out because we're looking for it. Yeah. You've got your whiteboard. You're ready looking for it because you get yeah. to draw it up in post game and show what they did. And I don't think we've really had one of those. No, I mean, that's not nobody would really call this team all that clutch. Right. That's not the, the, the word that comes to mind for them. Certainly not recently, but even even earlier this season, the few times that they have scored with the empty net and stuff, it wasn't really coming off of drawn up plays or anything. Right. There's been a lot of times where I've seen that. And yes, some of it is they're not a good face off team and that'll kill anything before it even starts. So I'll give him that. Um, but I, I just think that 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 aspect of it has to be there. You need you need some new voices in and around. um and, and to be perfectly honest, I don't know that I'd bring back Jay Leach anyway, just because look at how kind of disastrous this season has been defensively, right? Like yeah. all the good that he had, all the good will that he had kind of built up last year with how well the blue line was playing. So much of that is gone this year because of the focus issues they've had and just the basic mistakes that we're seeing on a nightly basis right now, RJ game after game. And it was no clearer than just watch any of those goals last night. This defense is the easiest defense in the world to play against. I have to imagine if you pulled NHL players right now, they'd be like, oh yeah, the Kraken defense, super easy to play against because they're not physical. They don't defend the interior at all. You want you want to set up in the slot, you'll have time and space, go for it. And they get walked so easily. I mean, that happened a ton in the Arizona game. I mean, guys are just going around them. It's happened in a lot of these games. They're just going around them. The defense is essentially not doing anything right. They can't even go back to basics and just play a simplified conservative style because they're just still, they're letting guys get behind them. They're letting guys set up in the slot. They're letting guys walk around them. They're letting guys cycle below the goal line, right? Like they're not getting in, in the way at all. Your greatest weapon as a defenseman is to take away time and space. And I can't tell you the last time I saw anybody on this blue line do that to anyone. Right, they are giving time and space. That's the one thing you can control defensively. Everything else you have to be reactionary towards. Right, you got to be reactive. You have to react to what the other team is doing. The one thing you can control is how much you pressure them and how much you limit their ability to do what they want to do. And right now, this team isn't doing any of that. And and I think so. I think also Jay Leach kind of has to be looked at here too, just because that's been a consistent problem for like three or four months now, and it's only somehow getting worse. And I wonder, too, because last season they made such great strides defensively. I do wonder how much health factored into that. I mean, they were able to run pretty much the same six blue liners almost all season. And another thing I think that's been exposed a bit this year is that this blue line can't really survive an injury, much less two. I know losing your best defenseman, Vince Dunn, hurts a heck of a lot like that's going to mess up any team but even if you look at earlier in the year whether it's um you know guy, like other guys that were out i mean like even you know, between schultz dumoulin just that that turnover they struggled to kind of deal with it at times yeah you know whenever there has been the rare injury or you know because it wasn't just this most recent done injury but he was injured earlier, earlier in the season too and they struggled then as well i don't know it, it seemed like last year everything went right for them from a health standpoint and that probably made them look better than they were yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, everything about this team, with the exception of goaltending, looked better last year than probably yeah. they were. They're able to outscore your problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and <laughs> you just don't have that right now. And I know everybody will say oh, it was the fourth line. No, this these are problems that go so far above and beyond the fact that you don't have a bunch of guys that were playing eight to ten minutes a night for you. Right. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. It just they, they were not the difference between last year and how bad the team has performed this year. Right. Like, it, they just can't be. Um, and uh, a yeah, factor, but certainly not the only factor. Yeah, they were not the factor. So we've uh, do you have anything else to report on from uh, today? Yeah, I mean, I guess just some some kind of housekeeping here. Uh, Matty Beniers was not at practice today, so that, of course, is notable. Uh, Haxtell called it just a maintenance day for him, but did say he's a little banged up. So I wonder, too, when we're talking about scratches and who goes out for Morrison and Winterton, I, I wonder if maybe Matty does have to have to miss a game at some point, just given that he's banged up. That's something to monitor. Uh, and then also Riker Evans took a hit in the first period last night. He was not at practice today. Haxtell called him day to day. But the fact that he wasn't on the ice today, you know, may, maybe tells me that he's at least somewhat questionable for the next yep. game. They haven't called anybody up yet. He was asked if they would need to call someone up. And he's like, well, you know, maybe he didn't give a committed answer to that. So we'll kind of cross that bridge if when they come to it. So those were kind of the other two 
uh, you know, newsworthy items from practice today. Yeah, it's such a bummer with Riker too, especially right after scoring his first goal and everything. Uh, he was he was starting to turn things around, right? You know, especially with the shakeup and letting him play up with Lars. Um, all right, so I, we've done a lot of talking about things, and I'm not someone who likes to just talk about problems and not offer solutions, right? Like that's I I don't know that that does a ton of good. I say as we're 40 minutes into this podcast already, and we've done a lot of just talking <laughs> about problems. So I want to try to offer solutions here, um, two things, uh, and so I wanted to talk about kind of what we want to see from this team, you know, over the off season going into next year, right? Ways of you know, addressing and talking about these problems, but, but offering solutions, not making, not feeling like we're just piling on to everything here. And we've already kind of talked about some of that stuff already. Um, but I've got a couple things in mind and I'll go ahead and start. Cause I, I've talked about this in the past RJ about wanting to save it for today, even though this feels less important today than it did before. And that's, um, I think if the team's not going to be able to go out and find a bunch of goal scoring in free agency, RJ, you know, a superstar player in free agency, then their next best, uh, you know, place to look is just for some net front presence, right? We've, we've seen it during this stretch. They've really struggled to score that some of the, some of the few games where the only goal they get out of it is because they have a net front presence. It's somebody there with a tip, somebody there with a screen. And I do think that if you are a team that's struggling to score, that's kind of your way of manufacturing some goals, right? It's like the equivalent to bunting a guy over. If you're playing small ball baseball, you can get in there and have somebody there to screen a goalie and have that net front presence. And that is something that should be a lot easier to find in free agency than going out there and trying to just find goal scoring. And so I wanted to throw that one out there is I, I we haven't talked a ton about it. And obviously we'll talk more about um, specific guys going, you know, as we get closer to free agency and everything. But I do think that that's an option for the off season from a roster construction standpoint that Ron Francis can look like that I think would have a material difference on this team next year. Yeah, I mean, how long have we been talking about it? When Usually when we reference Jaden Schwartz, how he's the only guy on the team who's really willing to do that job and does it consistently. Uh, there's nobody else that can provide that. And so you see these long stretches. I mean, the one the Kraken are in right now where they've you know, scored, what, seven goals in their last six games or something like that. A lot of that is a result of the inability to get inside and get those rebound chances that are there, but nobody can go in and get them. And you don't need size to win all those battles. You can work your way there. We've seen Yanni Gord do it in the past. Uh, hey, Jaden Schwartz isn't even the biggest guy, but it helps. It, it is a, a really helpful factor getting there. And there will be guys on the market who are willing to do that, who have the size to get there and the willingness to get there. And they don't even need to be the best finishers. You just kind of create chaos in front and the Kraken have enough guys who can be on that second level of the perimeter who kind of jump in and, and take those pucks that result from the chaos and put them in the net. But I, I'm with you. I think that is an area of need, whether they acquire a dynamic score or not. I think even if you do bring in a superstar winger who can just create goals by himself, that's still an area of deficiency for you. And so whether you address the star player or not, I think that is a way to go. You have to add somebody who can do that job. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's that's kind of my first thing that I want to see from them is just, you know, figure out an upfront presence. Already we're starting to see some benefit to it too with um Matty Beneers on the power play, right? In the cu couple games that they've really kind of committed to having him there on the power play, he's looked a lot better. He looks natural. For the first time, it looks like he has somewhere to belong on the power play. And again, you know, speaking to to coaching probably shouldn't have taken you two full seasons basically and 10 games in year one to find a place for you know your your calder trophy franchise cornerstone to know where he belongs on the power play but you at least got there <laughs> yeah <laughs> better late than never i guess but yeah. yeah i mean that is that is one of the big puzzles right of where do you put him on the power play because you know on that right side for the one timers they found out pretty quickly right it's just not the fit for him he doesn't have it and it just it, it felt like they were kind of half heartedly trying different things. I don't know. I, I feel like it's a more pressing issue, I guess, trying to come up with a solution for. Yeah. Um, do you have something you, you would like to see from them? Yeah. I mean, I guess one thing I'd like to see from them, and again, I know it's a more general issue. I, I guess, you know, net front can kind of be general too. just get younger. And, and I know that's going to mean moving away, certainly in the forward group, like, I don't want to rag on Brandon Tanev too much in this because, like, you know, he's he's not there to score. But I'd rather see players in those positions, especially if it's a bottom six type of role, 
not just who have the, the potential to score maybe unlike Tanev has recently, but someone that's going to be, I guess, hungrier from the standpoint of trying to earn a spot in the league. And there aren't a whole lot of guys in, on the roster that are like that uh, right now. You know, Matty Beniers, he's, he's a Calder winner. He, he, you know, you know where he is in the NHL. Uh, but other than that, you look at the young guys on the roster, really, it's just Ty Karche in the forward group. And I feel like he's one of the few guys who's really trying and giving his all every mm -hmm. single game right now. You look at last game against Montreal where nobody was giving effort, right? But he was. I mean, there was a play in the second period where he drove the net, probably should have drawn a penalty the first time, but he was hauled down, no call, wasn't phased, got right back up, went and stole the puck in the offensive zone from a Habs player, took it again, and then got hauled down a second time, gave the ref no choice but to call it. But that's the kind of effort I want to see more of. I know that'll kind of take care of itself as you get like a Logan Morris and a Ryan Winterton, you know, maybe a Shane Wright even contributing to that as well. But I just, I want to see the approach in the off season be that none of these roster spots are, are guaranteed or, or sacred necessarily for these guys. Cause one thing that really worries me, and I've talked about it on the armchair GM streams, is that there there's have 11 of the 12 roster spots already under contract or, or RFA is ready to go. Yeah. And I, I think you have to move some of those guys out. Like I, I was already against the Everly extension. They've mm -hmm. done that, so you can't undo it. But that's the kind of mindset I, I didn't really like. Tanev is the guy I keep coming back to. But also, like I, I like Tomas Tatar. I think he's been a decent fit here. Don't re-sign him. Bring in somebody younger. Yeah. Um, you know, and and just moving on from some of those guys. I mean, heck, if you if you can move like a, a, a Jaden Schwartz or Yanni Gordy, you know, think about it maybe. Um, but I just I want to see an extra roster spot open up and that be given to someone younger who's really trying chomping at the bit to try and earn a spot in the NHL. Yeah. I Yanni Gord should have value. Right, I gotta think. I oh mean, yeah, we, you can move Yanni Gord. I meant if you can move Schwartz. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I don't know that that, that you could move Jaden Schwartz. Yanni Gord should have value. So if the Kraken decide to, I I can imagine that they should be able to do that very, uh, fairly easily. Um. So, but yeah, I'm I'm with you. Right. Like that's that has been part of this problem. You talk about uh, earlier the motivations, the complacency that I was talking about, and the fact that yes, your your motivation to win a Stanley Cup has been removed from the equation because you know you're not making the playoffs generally one of the other things that helps keep athletes motivated is you're playing to keep a job for next year right but uh, so many of these guys on this team have fairly good job security that they don't necessarily have to worry about that and uh yeah if you put a little bit of fear into them maybe that's not the worst thing in the world um my last one and this is kind of like a big one uh with and it encompasses a lot of different areas but the thing that i want to see next year for this team is I want them to have an identity because this team has no identity. And I mean this on and off the ice, right? I'll stick with the on the ice stuff first here. Um, they don't have a system, right? They don't have a style of play that you look at and you say, that's cracking hockey. That's what this team does. That's how they approach games. That's how they win games, right? Uh, that is not what this team works like at all. I couldn't tell you right now really what their system is as their lines change nightly, as the system has changed two or three times this year. Um, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's all over the place. I talked about it on the post game last night. This is something I've really been thinking about as I look around the league. Uh, you look at teams like Vegas, you know exactly how Vegas is going to approach each and every game and how and why they win. You look at Vancouver under Tockett, and you know how and why they win and how they approach the game and what their game is going to look like. Boston under Jim Montgomery, right? Uh, Colorado under Jared Bednar, right? Like, you know what these teams play like. You know what Dallas plays like under Pete DeBoer. You know what their idea of hockey is and for them and, and what they're going to want to do out there. And we don't really know what the identity for the Kraken is system-wise. And one of the benefits of having an identity system-wise is a coach can come in, start establishing that. Year one, you know, you're just laying the groundwork, right? You're just setting it up. But then years two, three, four... You can start adding things. Players become used to it. They know the basics. So now you can start adding on that second, third, fourth level of it where you have situations where whether it's Vegas or Vancouver has been really good at adapting to this very quickly under Rick Tockett. You got to give them credit for this is they know entering the zone 
what to do and and where everybody on the ice is going to be regardless of what position they're playing um, because they'll all change it based on where they are on the ice based on what the other team is doing right how many guys are defending okay we're on a two-on-one chance i know how the trailing guy is gonna the third guy entering the zone behind me is going to enter the zone where he's gonna be right doesn't matter if that's quinn hughes on defense doesn't matter if it's a forward i know where he's gonna be and i know i have that drop pass available to me right if you're vancouver vegas they know okay we're entering the zone it's a two-on-two situation i know i need to cut to the middle and i need to like kind of lay out a pick on this guy and i got to provide the puck carrier with some time and space right and everybody up and down the lineup knows exactly what they need to do in each and every one of those situations and it allows them to go out play consistently and play effectively right they're efficient they score goals they they win games and, and that's the kind of thing that a coach builds to, right? It's generally, it doesn't happen all the way year one, although in some of these cases it does, and, and maybe these days it happens faster than it used to. But the fact that you've had this coaching staff, you've had Dave Haxtall in place for three years, and you've essentially not built to anything is a problem on ice for me. And I, I don't want to really con- see that continue in the next year. I want them to have a firm grasp on what kind of hockey they want to play. And I, and I feel like that would benefit them a lot. Um, and then just in general around the team, I want them to have an identity. What it, what does it mean to go to a Kraken game, right? Because we've seen game ops for the Kraken change dramatically year over year um, as, as we've covered this team. And it's very stark and, and obvious to me because I'm up there so infrequently. I'm sure for people who go a lot more frequently, the change happens a lot slower and it may not be as obvious. But I, if I when I go up there, I'm going up there four months at a time you know, in between. And it's like, I'm watching a completely different game experience each and every time I want there to just be some stuff and have them settle into an identity where it's, this is Kraken hockey for the fans. And this is the way the fans behave and what they do. And I think they're slowly starting to get there. We've got Benny Drawbars. That's kind of become like a, a mainstay. And I feel like he's really become part of that identity. Um, but there's still a lot of components to all this that have been up and down. They come and go. They're not consistent with it. Hoist the Colors has disappeared here recently. I know some people speculating it's because they just don't have the fans to do it, which is a different concern. But, you know, that's there. Um, there's stuff like that. And I so I just think in general, all the way around, front office, coaching staff players and game ops this team needs an identity rj yeah I, i'm i'm with you and i think it in a grand sense right that's the best way you can kind of sum it up right i mean i, I guess for my last thing I'll, I'll do kind of an on ice and an off ice like you did um i'll, I'll start with the off ice because that's kind of where you left off and i think this relates to to what you were talking about but i i think prioritizing just accessibility to people. We've talked about, you know, how with the TV deal is really limiting. It's hard to see them on TV. If there's anything you can do about that. And I know that's a much larger conversation to have, but just focusing on the main pillars of making sure people are exposed to your product, Mm -hmm. whether it's that or getting people in to see the game in the building and hopefully doing that without the team being so bad that ticket prices just get down to the point where they're affordable. But you, when you have potentially exciting games that people can go see, I know they had a program. I wonder whatever happened to it, but remember at the start of this season where it was, um, they had certain games that were at like more affordable price points, like that, like, you know, $40, $20. Yeah. Like a family packages. I don't remember hearing much about that after like the very start of the season. Maybe they just sold those and and that was that. But just more of an emphasis to to get people in the building and just be aware of their sport and your team because I think there's still a lot of of work that can be done on that. And I mean, I, I have you know much longer yeah, ideas for things that they can do. And so it's not the time to get into that, but just have that as as a main kind of pillar in the off season. Because there's a lot of things organizationally on the ice or even, you know, with the roster that you can focus on. But I think more important than all of that, you know, is just focusing on that side of the fan outreach for, you know, for the long term. On the ice, uh, we touched on a little bit with Maddie Beneers and how long it took them to find a spot for him on the power play. But particularly on the power play, I want to make sure the same thing doesn't happen with Shane Wright. Mm -hmm. You got to figure out exactly where, because that's power plays one of the most high leverage situations in hockey, right? Those are the two areas, power play and penalty kill, where you can really draw something up and and you can have the greatest impact as coaches in leveraging your personnel. At five on five or at even strength, hockey is just such a chaotic, free-flowing game. It's really hard to impact the game in that way. But on the power play, I want to see a defined role for Shane Wright by the end of the season. 
Like you need to figure it out. It doesn't have to be what you try first. You can try out different areas. But by the end of the season, I want to know exactly where Shane Wright is making the biggest difference on the power play. Yeah. I know in Coachella Valley, we've seen him kind of on that right side, taking the shot. We saw him there a little bit last season for the Kraken, but just, you know, make sure that works and that you can stick with it or find something else. Same thing with Matty Beniers. It's just, we already talked about it, but you need to know where the future of your franchise, those two top five picks that you have. And heck, I'll throw even Riker Evans on there just because I see a, a long-term future for him on the power play. Know exactly how they are creating that advantage for you mm-hmm. because the power play has been you know, bottom third of the league for too long. And like you said, there's no, there's no star player out there that we can tell, right. That's going to go out and fix it immediately. The answer has to come from within and you have the skill and the talent to do it from within. You've got a couple top five picks and you've got a great quarterback in Riker Evans. Make sure you figure out how exactly they are helping you leverage those situations. Yep, definitely. No, I'm, I'm all about that. And, uh, you know, speaking of Shane, Wright, Let's, let's talk to about the firebirds as I know we, we talked a lot about offering solutions there. And then we just said, well, I have more to talk about all of these things, but we can't get to it, but it's, it's, we will get to it over the, over the coming weeks, everybody, I promise. Um, but we got to get to be a long summer. We got time. Yes, we do. Uh, we got to talk about the firebirds here. Uh, RJ, I was fortunate enough to, to catch their game the other night against Texas stars, uh, at home fantastic win great clutch finish i mean you know the comeback tie the game get the game winner you know with uh, under five minutes left or whatever it was right and and just the building erupts and it's just so much fun to be there i was i was able to finally have a victory gatorade for the first time in like a million years uh so <laughs> you've been so saving that one up, love huh? that yes definitely definitely uh, i had to had to blow a lot of dust off that thing uh before i i had it um you know, let's let's start with the guys that were called up, and then we can kind of get more into the Firebirds' experience and Shane Wright and Dan Bilesma, and and maybe what the roster will start to look like next year. Because I have questions about that after being there. Um, but but just from a, a Ryan Winterton, Logan Morrison standpoint, I think they picked the absolute right two guys to call up right right here. Um, I mean, they've both played fantastic this year. We had the podcast um, not that long ago where we kind of talked about who would you call up to try to be, you know, the, the shot in the arm for the Kraken or whatever. And um you know, if it wasn't going to be a Shane Wright or whatever. And Logan Morrison was the guy that I talked about because he has just played so fantastic down there. He he just gets it. He just gets it. And he has that potential to be that next um, Ty Cartier guy. So I'm, I'm super, super excited for him to be one of the two guys here, RJ. And I hope so bad that they play him uh, and he's able to make his NHL debut tomorrow night against Anaheim. Yeah, and it sounds like they will. Haxtell wouldn't commit to it, of course, because he's not going to commit to anything like that. But uh, Winterton certainly hinted that they'd be playing tomorrow and playing together also. Mm-hmm. Uh, he kind of he said, we'll be lucky enough to play together, and so hopefully I'll find him, maybe he'll find me uh, kind of thing. And and so it's great to see them also come up together because mm-hmm. I, I don't know how much you you know saw this when you were in Coachella Valley, but those guys are inseparable. They're roommates down mm-hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they spend so much time with each other, and I think it's really going to benefit both of them to come up at the same time and with each other. Yeah, we saw this when um, Ryan Winterton and Shane Wright came up, and they played with Devin Shore, and and that mm-hmm. kind of like worked. Uh, it looked pretty good. Uh, if if they are indeed going to play together, RJ, do you have an idea of who they might be playing with? No idea. There were no line rushes today. Nothing we could glean out of practice to to get that hint. So I I don't know who they're going to play with. Who do you want to see him play with, Dylan? I mean, it's going to be interesting, right? I assume you're going to be starting Logan Morrison on the wing, so you need a center for them. Uh, I mean, do you go veteran with Belmar? Like, I, I don't yeah, know maybe. that 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 totally works from like, a dynamic fit, standpoint. I, well, that's the thing. When Wright and Winterton were there, I know Wright's the center, but you wanted somebody with a little more speed, a little bit more dynamic yeah. to play them with. And I feel like Belmar might hold them back a little bit. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, do you go Yanni Gord and you think you just trust like Yanni Gord's gotten the message and here's some young guys for him to play with? Maybe that perks him up a little? And the way he was practicing today, I might give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, otherwise, I might say maybe not. But yeah, I, I can think of a bunch of wingers I might want to play him with, but the center options are just limited. I mean, the, the only guy left is Jared McCann. Yeah, if Maddie's not going to go. Yeah. Because he could. I, I wouldn't put Maddie, them with but... Maddie. Yeah. I don't know. I certainly not banged up Matty Beniers 
I just I put him <laughs> with someone who's at least a hundred percent yeah and healthy. Anyway, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. They both guys, you don't have to worry about like you know ELC slide stuff or anything. I'm happy for Ryan Winterton to get another crack at the NHL, get some more games in. I think that'll help him coming into training camp next year as he kind of battles for a roster spot. I think he's probably on the outside looking in based on things right now. But I'm happy for him to get that. And then like I said, I'm super happy for Logan Morrison. This sends a huge message. Just like the way it you know did last year with Ty Cartier, right? It sends the message to everybody in Coachella Valley. If you play well, we will notice you. We will give you an opportunity, right? Even though it seems like we've got a million guys at the NHL level, you never know. And and if you're playing well, we will give you the call up, not just the 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 super high draft picks and everything like that, right? So uh, I like that message being sent there. I'm sure some people were wondering why Shane Wright wasn't called up, RJ. Especially given, like mm-hmm. we said, they're a little thin at center right now. Um, my idea, just based on having seen what I saw in Coachella Valley, and this was really, really great to see, is because I think Shane Wright is is sneakily the leader of the Coachella Valley Firebirds. I think he That's is... That's good to hear. Yeah, I know. But I, I think he is the guy. Uh, he's out there helping run warm-ups. He's the guy out there that has the the good mix of, you know... I'm taking this really, really seriously, but I'm also going to not let myself take it too seriously. Like, that's what I saw from him um, in situations there. I've been seeing it all year, right? He's, he's, he's the guy, if they need to double shift somebody, he's the guy who gets double shifted, right? He gets to go out there. He's only playing about, I think, uh, Gino Miakin on, on the Discord had it at about 17 minutes a night, right? Because we don't get official ice times, but Dan yeah. likes to run the lines pretty even, in Coachella Valley because he can because it's such a deep team so you know for for him to get that level of ice time in a situation like this I think is okay um but but Shane Wright really impressed me and I really got the sense RJ that he is a leader down there on that team he is a guy who is committed to doing whatever it's going to take for that group of guys to win oh basically all the stuff that we're talking about the Kraken not having for the last couple weeks Shane Wright has it and he has it there with the Firebirds and so I could see them not wanting to deal with the situation of the ELC and all of that stuff but I could also see them just going you know what he's really grown and built a ton of confidence and he's really trying to take that team and put it on his shoulders and we want that to continue we don't want to disrupt that part of the process for him yeah i mean that all makes sense certainly if that's the case aside from all the other stuff we've already covered where you don't want to play him for too long because then you you know the elc slide all of that it doesn't make sense and i I forget how many games it is where he loses calder eligibility it's only three games i think yeah and I feel like you it's not a big deal. You know, he cares about winning and, and you know, six, team success a lot more than he does about an individual award like that, I'm sure. But I kind of want that carrot out there for him where yeah. he can strive to potentially win the Calder next year. So I wouldn't want to play him any more than that anyway. But yeah, if he is the leader down in Coachella Valley, don't mess with it. Yeah, don't mess with it at all. No, and that's just that's just what I got. He he looked like, and we've seen him be in leadership situations before. Um, I mean, we've talked about this with Matty Beneers in the past, and and being you know potential young leader, future captain, all that kind of stuff. I mean, Shane Wright, he was the he was the captain when Team Canada won gold at the World Juniors a couple of years ago, right? Like he captained that team, and um, somebody had brought it up in the chat last night. But you go back and you ask all the guys on that team, and everybody was like, oh yeah, he was the guy. Like he was the leader we saw this at dev camp last year right he wanted to be the leader i think he is a guy who wants to have that leadership responsibility who is comfortable standing up in a locker room and and taking it upon himself and talking to other guys going to the coaching staff with things talking to them um i i think shane wright really has that and i think he's really grown with it at the professional level this season and on a team where he is the youngest guy Right. And that's what's impressive. We talked about this with Matty Beneers, maybe not willing to step in because you have so many established leaders and veteran guys on this roster. It's the same case in Coachella Valley, but it looks like Shane Wright has stepped up and he has gone with those guys and he has asserted himself and he has taken on responsibility for himself as the youngest member of that team. And so that just stood out to me. And I wanted to let everybody know that because I think he's taking it all very seriously. I don't think any of the weird Reddit rumors of him wanting to go somewhere else because he's not getting NHL playing time. No, you don't see it an ounce of that in him, uh, you know, hearing him talk or, or just watching him in and around the facility. That's, that's not a thing. That's not a thing at all. Um, and then 
Uh, the other thing, RJ, obviously the experience down there is great. The Game Ops team does such a fantastic job putting on such a great show. I mean, there's there's all those aspects. I've talked a bunch before, but we're short on time today, so I'll, I'll kind of skip those for now. I'm sure during the playoffs I'll be talking about them a ton. Um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, though, was I was down there and I was talking with some of the uh, Sound of Hockey guys and with um, you know uh, Curtis, uh, Deep Sea Hockey, and we were talking about what this roster could look like next year because a lot of the veteran guys for the Coachella Valley Firebirds, their contracts are up, right? Whether it's um, Max McCormick, Andrew Paul Rolski, Cameron Hughes, Devin Shore, John Hayden, um, Luke Henman. I mean, a lot of these, all these guys, their contracts are up at the end of this year. And so I know there was a ton of stuff talking about with the Kraken here, RJ and everything. Student each your boy, his contracts up at the end of the year, RJ. Oh no. I know. So I just wanted your opinion and then I'll kind of give what, what mine and, and talking with, with Curtis is uh, his opinion was. Um, but what, what do you think that, that the Firebirds are going to do next year, RJ, because you have a great group right now. This is a team that went to game seven of the finals last year. Their second best team in the AHL this year, as far as points in the standings, do, do you go back and bring back a lot of those veteran guys or do you start looking to the future knowing you're going to have a big youth movement become eligible for the Firebirds next year? I, I do think they're going to embrace that youth movement. I, I think especially as the draft classes continue to pile up and pile up for the Kraken, where right now they you know only have a few draft classes, so you don't have the same prospect pool as every other team. You know, you're able to have a lot more vets there, but I think you do want to ultimately start making that transition. Uh, I think they pick one or two guys of, of that kind of core leadership group to bring back because you certainly don't want to let them all go. Whether, you know, it's it's McCormick, sure, Hughes, I, I, maybe Hughes and McCormick, you know, are the two that I'd look and you really want to bring back. Yeah. Potentially, because I guess the Kraken don't have a ton of prospects coming up on D mm -hmm. next season. So maybe you'd want to keep around like, a, a you know, Jimmy Schultz or I actually got Olsen under contract for next year as well. So those guys can kind of anchor the blue line from a veteran standpoint. But I think we do see a lot more youth next year. I don't know, which, which what way were you thinking? Uh, I'm I'm with you. I th I think that's uh, that's the unfortunate reality is that a lot of these guys are probably not going to be back with the Firebirds next year just because of how many guys you have coming in, particularly at forward. Uh, I think that's where there, a lot more of the log jam exists is, is at the forward spot. Um, I, I'm with you. I think Hughes is the guy that would be my top priority. I think Max McCormick's probably second. And then you know what? John Hayden might be third because they just love him. And, like I, you do. just have random people who work for the team just come up to you and, and talk to you and they just all love John Hayden. Like everybody to a person loves John Hayden. Um, and I heard so many good stories about the work that he does down there and stuff. So you might want to bring back John Hayden just, just as like a, a good guy to have around uh, for the team, for everybody, especially if you're going to have a lot of young guys, there's going to be growing pains. And it sounds like he might be a guy who can kind of come in and, and help nurture um, everybody involved there. But otherwise, uh, you know, part of the reason I, I bring it up is just because like, it's going to be so – it's exciting to watch the Firebirds right now because they're so good and they're so competitive and they're doing so many things right. And next year it's going to be exciting for a completely different reason because we're going to see – you know, Jagger Fergus, David Goyette, Yanni Newman, right? Like Tucker Robertson have an expanded role. Jacob Melanson have an expanded role from this year. All those guys are going to come in and really kind of take take control of this team, take, be the guys. They're going to have to step up. They're going to be having to play the big minutes, and it's going to be fascinating. I think the team will take a step back, right? Like they're going to have to, right? Especially because you're also not going to have the goaltending anymore because Chris Drieger's going somewhere else. He's not going to be staying against your AHL goal. You can't find a goalie of that caliber. Yeah. That was just kind of a, a lucky, lucky happenstance there. Definitely. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the team goes, but I think it's going to be a very fun to watch team and a, and a team worth going to see, but just for different reasons next year to see how all of these prospects that we've kind of grown and followed all of their journeys, their whole, their whole process and time in the Kraken organization. And we're going to see them take that that next step and play for that organization and play under coach Dan Bilesma and play under coaches like Jess Campbell and, and be around um, the, the kind of structure and great culture that the team has built. Because that's the other thing is that the culture down there is just so perfect top to bottom. It's, it's absolutely perfect. You couldn't have done it any better. And so um, it's just, it's a really cool thing. So I, I wanted to put it out there that like, you know, go see the Firebirds now, if you can maybe be a part of that playoff run if possible, or just subscribe to AHL TV for the playoff package and, and watch them go on their run because we might not see them be as, as kind of ultra competitive next year. Um, but still the future down there is still so bright and it's so fantastic. 
Yeah, A plus organization, top to bottom. I mean, they've done things perfectly down there. If you have not been to a, a Firebirds home game, find a way to get down there. Well, you know, find it, find a good priced flight and get down there for a game. It is just a level of excitement that I, I think will surprise anybody. Even though we've hyped it up so much, mm -hmm. uh, it, it will exceed your expectations. It is a fantastic time, and honestly, a little jealous, Dylan. That you got to go check out that game. It was a good one too. I it's mean, they scored really late one. to to go get the win, and uh, I'm gonna try and go down there for the playoffs with you because mm -hmm. I just got to do it. Also, they're hosting the AHL All Star Game next year, yeah. so if you're looking to plan a trip further in the future, that's a good time to do it as well. Yeah, I think that's what tech. It's it's technically in 2025, right? Early 2025. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So yeah, you know, get get on that now. Um, flight's probably a little cheaper if you do that sooner rather than later generally how it works uh, so, yeah, yeah. so yeah so that that would be a lot of fun but I, I wanted to give them the shout out there and yeah rj let me tell you it's a little bit different watching that team from this team especially when they're say down a goal late <laughs> yeah you have a different feeling about how things might go it was definitely exciting just like things get really exciting over at queen and beer hall rj like we all know like everybody knows i mean i talked to people on this trip too um that you know they they mentioned they're, they're you know maybe local to phoenix or local to coachella valley but i heard this in both places from people they go to they go to queen Anne beer hall every time they go up to seattle to watch the kraken they go they make sure they go to queen Anne beer hall um so i wanted to throw that out into the pod i probably should have led with that and saved the march madness stuff for the end but eh, oh well it's a reward for everybody listening and lasting this long um so i want to thank them once one more time looking forward to seeing some people in the prospect chat this evening as well over at patreon.com slash emerald city hockey and we will see everybody next time Hey everyone, before we go, we just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash emeraldcityhockey, especially our Terror of the Deep patrons. Absurdly Sane, Alaska Joe, Alex, Alvi, Andrew, Andrew, Andre, Anonymous, Anthony, Becca, Beef, Ben, Brad, Bryce, Burnt Krem, Caden, Kat, Kaylin, Chandler, Charles, Shazzle Dazzle, Chip, Chris, Christian, Clutch, Cody, Connor, Coop, Corey, Cutter, Dan, Danny39, Denise, DJ Singletone, Duthin, EV99, Eli, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Empty Net Hockey, Ethan, Evan, Fusion Mix, Gaby, Gabrielle, Gary, Gregory, Helena, Habak, Jane, Jenna, Jessica, Joni, Joseph, Josh, Joshua, Julia, Justin, Katie, Kepler, Kevin, Kitty B. Kraken, Cole, L. Bell, Leanne, Levin, Light, Little Tennis Guy 8, Lonnie, Mac and Cheese, Maeve, Mark, Max, Maya, Michael, Michelle, Nick, Night Drop, Noah, Nunya, Olivia, Paige, Patty, Paul, Rayanne, Randall, Rebecca, Robert, Rock Licker, Ryan, Sarah, Scott, Sia Kraken, Sean, Sean, Sergey, Sergeant Pickles, Shannon, Skeletal Tendency, Steven, Striatic, Tasty Kobold, Team 114 Chris, Ty, Virginia, Wendy, Where the Slovakians At, and Zoe. Thank you so much for making all this possible. We really appreciate your support.